It is a great pleasure to introduce Professor Eugene Wang, who is Albi uh, Adrich Rockefeller Professor of Asian Art at Harvard University. Professor Wang first studied English and Comparative Literature in Fudang University before joining Harvard University, where he earned his PhD in 1997 with a dissertation on Pagoda and Transformation, the Making of Medieval Chinese Visuality under the, gui the guidance of Professor Wu Hung. From uh, 1995 till 1997, he taught uh, art history at the University of Chicago before coming back to Harvard, where he has uh, remained ever since. Professor Wang's expertise covered the whole range of Chinese art history, from Han bronzes to contemporary painting, but its core, his core expertise directly relates to what he will talk about tonight. In his much acclaimed uh, monograph, Shaping the Lotus Sutra, Buddhist Visual Culture in Medieval China, which was published in the UW uh, University of Washington Press in 2005, uh, he masterfully explored the complex world created by especially transformation tableau, Bian Xian, in Buddhist painted caves. One of the reviewers of uh, that work, uh, James Ben with uh, Solas Alum, has termed this book a challenging, clever, um, and provocative book that is bursting at the seams with insights and ideas. So the, it is thus with great excitement that I now invite uh, uh, Professor Wang to lead us like a Virgil of sorts, into the fascinating world of Chinese Buddhist caves. Here comes his lecture, whose title is How to Experience Buddhist Caves as Virtual Reality. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank Robert Hof Foundation for making this lecture series possible. And I also want to thank uh, Vincent Tournier and uh, all the SOIS colleagues who um, have been very supportive and uh, show their confidence in inviting me to um, inaugurate this uh, series. And I know what's at stake. It's a make or break it moment. <laughs> if this is a, t a disaster, then we will, I mean, the consequence we can all foresee. So, um, so much is at stake. Now, um, so without much further ado, uh, I'm going to start right away. Now, virtual reality is here to stay, and it's everywhere. We can all uh, uh, feel that, that uh, heat and the wave. Um, but what really fascinated me about this whole phenomenon is the device that was first started in 1992 at the University of Illinois in Chicago where they have this um, project, essentially a projection space called a cave. Or, um, so it in fact is a very nice play on word because a uh, cave is uh, in their technical terms uh, cave automatic uh, virtual environment that's spelled as cave. I think it doesn't quite work so they stick the first word cave there <laughs> to make it work. But, but, but um, um, so when it first started, it, it was, the cave is still kind of forced idea. It was, it was some kind of stretch because um, what it does is just give you some kind of uh, visual uh, replication of the observable phenomena, that sort of world we experience. So there's nothing probably uh, other than uh, getting this whole cave device uh, launched, probably not that much to speak of. Uh, but then we get to the later stage, things start to take new twists and turns and getting more and more interest. And this is a sort of, one might say, the second generation of cave device now developed at the uh, Cornell Medical School. That's one of the applications of this virtual reality device. Now what it does is actually to take you to the deeper realm uh, where uh, we don't, we mortals don't have a chance of venturing into, that is our human brain. So this, this, the fact that somehow you have this device allows you to venture into this uh, brain space 
that coupled with the current breakthrough in brain imaging, brain science, uh, make the whole thing very, very exciting. And um, it has been rightly observed that, in fact, in the, what we know about the brain in the, five, the past five years equal the amount of knowledge we know in the 5,000 years. So we are in a very exciting uh, moment. And therefore, I want to take this as a cue and, and ask ourselves the question, um, is there anything we, our historians, can contribute to this? Um, this is called a brain imaging. You heard a lot about that, the brain imaging. And pretty much if you read the book titles, this is your brain on Siddhartha, this is your brain on art, this is your brain on uh, um, you know, this or that. So that's the sort of common uh, uh, mantra you hear nowadays. So yes, the question is, OK, what, what is there any way we as art historians and also our historians of Chinese art, historians of Buddhist art, can contribute to this brain imaging discussion? Now, um, the, this image is a good cue in the sense that um, human yearning to delve into the inner world that we call brain to explain a, a mental phenomena and has been thousand years in the making. And I think the, uh, uh, probably the first venture, or at least the recorded, a documented first venture would be in around the first common, uh, the first century, the common era that the Alexandrian anatomists such as uh, roofers of Ephesus uh, provide us with the first, probably arguably first, uh, the physical description of what's like inside the brain. Uh, the basic structure essentially comes down to uh, the, the soft and hard layers uh, that encase the brain. So I, I imagine that they got that kind of knowledge by cracking apart the bull's skull because that's happened in China as well. You, you sort of take apart the, the bull's head and then you infer that, well, our human brain probably more or less the same. So um, then something I think a, a very interesting happened in the second century that when the Roman physician Galen um, um, essentially proved Aristotle wrong. And that is a very good turning point. Basically, Aristotle gave a lot of weight to um, in fact, I was trying to explain mental activity by way of heart. And uh, Galen, uh, the physician, actually uh, proved that to be wrong. And then, in fact, he said that this, you know, it's really the brain that is the seat of the animal soul. And um, so that more or less put us in the right kind of track, even though he said something that to the modern, um, um, to a modern um, scientist, may sound a little funny and, and uh, amusing at least and because he described the brain as a cold, moist organ formed of sperm. So, um, but nonetheless, uh, he put us in the right track uh, and then when we get to uh, 17th century and Descartes uh, followed that cue and gave us a brain chamber and that really is close to what I'm going to talk about today. Now, the way the brain chamber works is that um, he figured that this is occupied by a little, uh, little man inside. That has, of course, been dismissed by philosophers nowadays, this little humongous inside the brain uh, doing the controlling. Um, but nonetheless, the, the, uh, it was kind of interesting because he believed that um, there's that, um, um, there's a little, uh, pineal gland that uh, does the central switching. Um, what it does is that uh, the, 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 the nerve system will send the visual image up to the brain and that pineal gland would cause that to be transformed and then projected on the wall as if we are watching the inner movie or inner screen. So, Descartes' account of the brain overall has been dismissed, as I said, by current philosophers as a little bit uh, misguided. But nonetheless, this metaphor of the brain as a projecting room 
that can uh, screen the inner thoughts, the mental event, has stuck on. And so even the latest uh, publication on this aspect of things still call the brain uh, the little screen room. And I think it's, it, it still remains a good analytical construct. So that takes, up back, uh, takes us uh, to the Buddhist caves. In fact, this whole metaphor, the brain chamber, was quite relevant and apt in describing what a lot of Buddhist caves is all about. Uh, so here I show you a Buddhist cave in Bing Ling Si in northwest China, Gansu Cave 169. As you can say, uh, it is made of a, a, a spectacular a natural grotto. <coughs> Maybe the fact that it looks like a brain is a coincidence. I, I wouldn't read too much into that. <laughs> all right, so I, I but, but at least uh, it does something very interesting. So uh, over the surface of some of the inner walls, it's painted all these Buddhist uh, uh, subjects. And you might be, for anyone who has been there, would be completely ama amazed, because there's no, first of all, how did they manage to climb up there to paint them? Secondly, for what purpose? I mean, there's no way you can really look at them. <laughs> And, and so that's another, another. but in any case, um, what is interesting is that um, it, it came up around the time, around, so this is probably f uh, early 5th early, uh, uh, century, so we know for certain that around 400, um, there was this proverbial shadow cave, uh, this, this law of shadow cave that initially, uh, uh, that was spreading around in Asia from Kashmir to Kucha. And so what, it is, what the law is about is that they say there's this uh, grotto <laughs> occupied by a poisonous uh, dragon. And the dragon is making lots of trouble in the region and causing lots of concerns, anxiety. So at the plea of the local people, uh, Buddha, uh, came with his attendant, and they, uh, he subjugated the dragon in the cave. Um, and then he was about to leave, and the dragon said, well, don't leave, because if you leave, I'm going to revert back to my evil ways. And the, dragon said, oh, and the Buddha said, what do you want me to do? Um, and the dragon said, uh, please, please stay for another 1,500 years. So, and here's this spectacular uh, dramatic moment, and Buddha at uh, that promised, and he, so the text says, leaps into the wall where he stays as an image, and the image preached the law. Now, this is one of the most amazing scenes, because essentially what you have is a action figure who just bumps into the wall, and then all of a sudden, lo and behold, there's an image on the wall. And, and subsequently, in fact, I don't think people elsewhere took it that seriously, but the Chinese took it very seriously. So subsequently, all the pilgrims to that region, which is currently in, uh, um, in Afghanistan, in fact, uh, coincidentally, there was a cave where Bin Laden was hiding. Um, <laughs> So the Chinese pilgrims uh, um, f from um, Faxian through 7th century Xuanzang all took it very seriously. So they, whenever they had the occasion to visit the place, they would make sure to find out uh, where this shadow cave is. And Xuanzang actually gave us the account that he went in and saw nothing on the wall. And he said, well, it must be I have a bad karma. If I repent hard enough, I will be able to see. And in fact, so I have a lot, lot of mental work. Lo and behold, he could see the Buddha image on the wall. So um, in any case, as we read on from that text, so for anyone who's interested in, in reading uh, about this text, I've translated it in, and it's contained in the early medieval Chinese sources. So I translate all the related text uh, relate, uh, um, on that subject. In any case, so as we read on following that dramatic description of Buddha leaping into the wall, then we realize this is actually more of a rhetorical device because 
the subsequent passage start to say that, all right, if you want to uh, meditate and visualize, first think about a cave, and then think about yourself going inside the cave. Think about yourself looking at the wall. So, in other words, what it ends up saying is that, in fact, this whole cave is really a mental device, a mnemonic device, a visualization device. It probably doesn't exist out there in the real world. It's more of a way you organize your thought. Right? So, um, therefore, this whole thing, I would call it a shadow cave. It has some kind of interesting relationship with the Plato's cave, but today I, I, I wouldn't go into that because that opens up another can of worms. And, but let's just say that I'm interested in this mainly because it's a sort of cave that shows the mental event. And here I bring you to a real shadow cave. Uh, in fact, I, I, there's, there's, I can um, ascertain all sorts of internal evidence that this cave, uh, cave 254 at Dunhuang, uh, uh, excavated around 500, um, was very much taking cue from this um, so-called shadow cave. Now, um, there's much to be said about this cave, and I just want to um, uh, take you through it. So today, what, what I'm going to do today is to show what an amazing cave it is, and also it is really a kind of theater that showcases the mental events. So in some ways, you might describe it as the Chinese equivalent of Descartes' brain chamber. All right. So um, I'll first take, uh, walk you through by telling four stories. And so as you hear these stories, don't worry about where these stories are located. And they will come back to the cave and try to put them in order. The first story is the story, uh, by the way, uh, for those who were not in Buddhism, Jataka means a uh, tale of Buddha's former lives. So this tale is uh, called Mahasattva Jataka, also known as Tigris Jataka, uh, concerns us um, three brothers, uh, among them the youngest brother, um, who is on, one day on an outing, and then they, uh, they notice uh, something um, uh, pitiful happening. Uh, Tigris was about to die, and the young cubs um, also, because they couldn't get uh, fed, uh, they are also going to die. So the younger brother, youngest brother of uh, the three brothers, um, stay, start to take pity on this uh, um, sorrowful scene, and he decides to uh, give up his own body to feed the hungry tigress. And so he uh, jumped, first jumped uh, from the cliff, as you can see, uh, from the cliff, a cliff and tried to feed the tigress. And the tigress was too emaciated, weak, and couldn't possibly eat him. So he go, climbs back onto the cliff again and uh, using a bamboo stick to pierce his neck so that the blood oozes out, and with that he jumps down so that the tigress could first drink his blood and have enough energy then to eat him up. And the, um, so that's the uh, scene of diving, and the, um, and, and, and the tigress indeed has enough uh, energy to, or strength to um, uh, eat into his body. And that, of course, um, caused a great deal of uh, uh, panic in the brothers who hurried back to uh, get their mother, and the mother comes to only to collect a pile of bones. But the painter thought it would, wouldn't be gainly to uh, depict the pile of bones, so he still keep the body intact. But that was against the text's uh, intent. <coughs> that, uh, in fact, uh, what, what the textual narrative says is that you know, they collect the bones and then put the bones into a stupor, uh, stupor tower. And um, so that was the sort of end of the story. And all Buddhist Jataka end with one ending, which is that 
it's the voice of the Buddha saying, that was me uh, in my former life. All right. So the second Jataka story is King Sipi, who is also known for his uh, compassion. And then, um, then there's a dove chased by a hawk. As you can see, the dove chased by a hawk come to his presence. Uh, basically, hawk says, you have to make a choice because uh, oh, the dove pleaded him to save its life. Uh, and then the hawk makes it difficult for him to make up that decision because hawk says, if you save his, its life, then I am going to die. So, uh, so one way or another, you're, 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 you're seeing some, somebody dying. And he, being a very compassionate person, couldn't possibly let that happen. So he strikes a deal with this uh, hawk, saying that, uh, why don't we do this? Um, I give amount of flesh. You can gouge the amount of flesh that equals the dove's weight. And, um, and you can have that much of flesh and then let go of the dove. Um, the hawk says, OK, let's do that. So they put out a, a scale. And then here's something inexplicable happened. Uh, no matter how much flesh uh, was put onto the scale, it couldn't possibly equal the weight of the dove. So in the end, seeing this hopeless situation, the king basically threw his entire body onto the scale and said, just eat me. And upon that, it turns out that the, the dove um, and hawk, uh, the, the, the hawk is actually Indra, and the dove is uh, the uh, fire of God, and that they actually just putting on this test to see uh, if indeed he is for real in his claim of being a compassionate person. And again, the story ends in the same way as we all know. That was me in my previous life. All right. So that's the, that's the uh, King Sibi story. And the third story, we start to slightly shift gears. Uh, the previous two stories are all Jataka tales, meaning that these are the narrative of Buddha's former lives. Now the third and fourth story are all episodes from Buddha's own life. So this is a moment when Prince Siddhartha, um, having left household, seeking ways of ending human suffering, come to the moment where he, he, dis, uh, he meditates. And as he meditates, um, Mara, the, the, the king of uh, the de a realm of desire, um, sends his three beautiful daughter to seduce or distract the prince, young prince from uh, entering his meditation. And then the young prince uh, sees through it all and basically tells them that, you know, human life are not something you want to uh, cling to and, and uh, one day's beauty will end up being another day's old hack. So, uh, and, and as the, he says that, indeed, all these three young beauties will reduce to old women. And in the meantime, the painter also puts in this skeletal figure, which is actually part of the meditation uh, program that you uh, focus your attention on the skeleton and you think about the brevity of human life, therefore you have a way of transcending this. So that's the moment, uh, that's a, a very famous episode in Buddha's life called um, subjugation of demon. Right? Now the fourth story is uh, the moment of enlightenment and this is much more complicated so I will just leave that for a later moment to uh, uh, take um, further analyze it and uh, explicate it. So now this is a moment of reckoning, this moment. So the above, the above four st stories, if you visit Dunhuang, this is sort of story all the tourist guy can tell you. So I mean, there's nothing you know, particular uh, um, striking the way I can tell it. In other words, every tourist guy can tell you. Now, what? you're not going to hear from tour guide is from this moment on. 
<laughs> so my two lectures starts at this moment on, and it's something that uh, uh, I don't think anyone has heard much about. So I, I, preserve, I reserve this moment for Soas and for the whole family. <laughs> So here's a curious thing about this whole layout. I, just, I told you uh, four stories. Well, this one, I owe you one. Um, and if you look at the program, then you found this is kind of odd and strange because in terms of timeline, we are from this end, that is you enter Mughal Cave from the east, you head toward the west, and the program tend to be organized in such a symmetrical way, but it's also uh, 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 progressive from the front to the back of the chamber. So uh, if that is the progression, then it doesn't make sense to switch the order. In other words, the Jataka which pertains to Buddha's former life should start, and then you come to the present life, right? That would be the correct temporal order, but apparently the designer decides to switch the order, so that's the first uh, oddity. The second oddity is if you, for anyone who knows about Buddha's life, uh, is typically uh, broken down into, again, a set of events, a sequence of events. And there are many ways of slicing it, but just, you know, here's a more common one. Um, uh, that is, you divide Buddha's life into eight, eight junctures or episodes. And you start from the descent of heaven, you end with entering nirvana. Now, where do our Buddha's life episode appear? they appear right in the middle. So in other words, they actually uh, skip or omit entire four key episodes from Buddha's life, which is very, very strange. Why do they leave that all out if they go for drama, visual drama? I mean, these are the scenes that are equally uh, spectacular. And also, why is it that they, these two episodes happen to be really follow one another uh, closely, and, and, and so there has to be a reason that uh, um, they choose it to do it that way. So as you can see. So basically, I think it, it can be proved, but you know, we, we can skip that proving process just to say that uh, uh, both episodes are about meditation. Uh, both episodes about how you you enter this meditative state, and then all of a sudden things happen. So it is that meditation moment that is the sort of uh, game changer. Therefore, it uh, telegraphed to us the intent of this program programmatic design, which is that much of it <laughs> is about meditation. All right. Now, so that brings us to the fourth story that I owe you, that's on the North Wall. By the way, so South Wall, North Wall. So let's look what's going on in the fourth wall. There's a lot going on, but the key is, as I said, uh, meditation. And to the upper right corner of the composition, you have three uh, seated figures monk in, uh, wrapped in monk's robe and apparently sitting in caves meditating. And, but then you see the red, uh, bluish, and dark thing, and you wonder what it is about. In, um, what is going on here is, in fact, uh, fire, water, and wind. Each actually represents or is correlated to one particular meditative heaven. There are four meditative heavens in Buddhist schemes of things. So uh, three of them, are actually four of them, are all shown here. So we can see first you have the fire. By the way, also, um, here's a bit of sort of background. Um, Buddhist conceive of these, uh, the cosmos and human, uh, human existence um, in a sort of locked step or a correlated step. Uh, you renew through this destruction or the cycles of destruction, what they call kalpa of destruction. So there's first a destruction by fire, if you, uh, the world and yourself 
together with it, emerge from the cycle of destruction of fire, uh, get to the graduate to a second level, that is then the cycle of, of water, uh, destruction uh, 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 of wa water, and then you emerge, that gets you to another heaven. Um, and then, and once you emerge from that cycle, you get to the cycle of wind, that gets you to the third meditative heaven. Um, keep in mind what is called meditative heaven is no more than some kind of mental state. Um, Buddhism, to put it very bluntly, uh, basically equates psychology with cosmology. So whenever they talk about things in cosmology, you are better off translating them into psychology, vice versa. Right? So uh, after you go through uh, these three uh, cycles, you get to the, uh, here's the three cycles we want to take literally, and then you emerge on the fourth level, that is the fourth meditative heaven. And you, the, then you see this figure that represents the uh, fourth meditative state, essentially forever uh, free from these cycles. If you are uh, caught up in these three forever, you can't quite get free. And then this is the total freedom once you emerge from these three cycles. All right. Then the question is, once you get to that state, the high state of meditation out of the four, what happens to you? And there's a very neat scheme. Basically it says, well, you gain what is called the six supernormal cognitive abilities. All right, that's what you acquire. When you get to the meditative state, you have these uh, supernormal cognitive states. And I can demonstrate to you that, in fact, pretty much all of them are depicted in this composition or in this, in this wall, or in this cave. Let's take, for instance, the unimpeded bodily action. You can see the central Buddha now lifts himself, uh, uh, um, is, appears in levitation. Um, and here's a close-up. You can see he cross seated, cross-legged, and just hovering in mid-air. And there's that uh, river, uh, the water beneath him, and the two figures uh, standing beneath in the water, in the stream. And so this whole levitation um, is, still has its modern um, recapitulations. And in fact, there's a whole. Uh, group of people who believe, in fact, by meditation, you could indeed um, uh, achieve that levitated state. Um, I'm not weighing on either side. And in fact, I've just, I'm going to start a, a research program at Harvard with some students and try to uh, uh, vet the claims. Because uh, uh, the, the first instance we know that they photograph the levitation is in 1936 in, in England, I think, and where they, uh, they actually had someone doing this levitation and have uh, the, the cameras surrounding him. Uh, and so that case has been widely reported. So I'm asking a, a research assistant to vet for me uh, whether that can uh, stand. But in any case, it, it, it matters less for us. Uh, what matters more is, is that at least they believed uh, in this. Um, and in fact, uh, that's the sort of belief that this, this painting is uh, built upon. Um, there's also uh, the, at least the same goals that as you acquire that uh, first level of meditation, you acquire the so-called heavenly eye and heavenly ear. And both of these uh, capacities uh, are um, registered in the cave painting. Um, so, by the way, by heavenly eye, heavenly ears, that you are able to see across time and space. You see from the bottom, I mean, basically from the underworld all the way to the celestial world. Um, and also you can hear things that uh, you could he one could normally hear the underworld and the celestial realm. So here's uh, how the underworld um, is laid out uh, in the bottom register of the cave, and the celestial world is laid out at the top rim. Um, as you can see here, 
Uh, this is the underworld, and then you can see uh, figures here um, joining the uh, exaltation that the Buddha's uh, attaining um, enlightenment. And then and they, some of them actually play music, as you can see. Uh, so that is, as if, uh, this guy is uh, playing music, just to show that, in fact, uh, this, this, there's a sound being produced that you can uh, hear, or someone is able to hear. And then you could get to the top realm, top register, you can see a line, a array of musicians and dancers um, there. And again, you could see that they were playing music instrument, uh, playing uh, pipa-like string instrument, and so forth. So the idea is to say that you know someone sees all these, uh, someone uh, hears all these, and that you can only do so if you attain the so-called heavenly eye and heavenly ear. Now, um, here's a tough one for the painter in the uh, around 500. How do you depict the ability that you can recall previous lives? Because this is one of the uh, uh, six supernormal cognitive abilities. In the day and age when they don't have the film with uh, media, we can com conveniently show you the flashback being someone's recalled uh, me uh, mem memory or, or earliest episodes. Uh, this is how they do it. So they have the Buddha um, levitating in air and telling people what happened in the past, right? Because essentially that's also expensive the oddity that I laid out earlier, which is that why is it that they switched order? They switched order mainly because they want you to, to, to um, experience this as, the, as someone telling the story and some episode being recalled, or gathered, recollected. So that's the, that's the um, knowledge of past lives being recalled, uh, uh, being remembered. And then uh, the final um, ability is the extinction of outflow, ashrava, which is, means outflow or flow. And here's a bit of uh, a background in terms of concept, simple concept, but, uh, well, not, not simple, uh, but uh, we'll make it simple. Basically, it, it means um, a Chinese translated as flow or leaking, and uh, it has a lot to do with the yoga practice. So what you have, so ashrava means a sort of influx of karmic matter into the soul. And um, to give a simple example, if you, if you do meditate, if you think have a simple thought, then you think about somehow making money, then that's a sort of uh, the influx of some kind of karmic impure thought that makes into the pure, uh, 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 thinking process, so that's the sort of, so that's the sort of thought you need to stem or cut your ties. So yoga is one of those uh, ways of ending that karmic bonds. So let's see how our painting uh, treats this complex uh, set of concepts. So essentially what you have is that the, the le levitation occurs right above some kind of stream, and the stream is some kind of flow, you might say, and then it's for good reason that this levitation happens above that stream. It, it, it is another way of saying that, well, there's some kind of cutting a tie or transcending that. Well, I'm not just reading too much into it. In fact, there are other additional evidence or details in the composition that supports this hypothesis. If you uh, look at the corner, uh, there, this figure, uh, there's a man being torn away from a woman. And this has for a long time puzzled scholars. And I think that I'm the first one to get it right. 
I think. <laughs> Um, so what it, what it shows, in fact, is that uh, Shakyamuni at a certain point is, uh, after he left the household, returns or at least sent his uh, disciples to visit his son, Rahula, and, and sort of tearing him away from the mother um, named Gopi or Yashodara. I mean, sometimes uh, the texts treat them as two different persons, sometimes treat as one, but for us, the idea is that there's mother, there's a son, all right. Um, um, so, of course, they cause a lot of drama. The woman says, you know, it, it is as if, you know, you have left the household. Is that in, not enough? You are now taking away my son? That's way too much. And then eventually, somehow, she comes around. And then not only does she come around, she asks, actually eventually she leaves household uh, uh, to join the ranks of the Buddha's uh, followers. So that's essentially, it, the narrative essentially, if we boil it down, is really to leave the household life to the houseless life, to cut ties to the earthly life, to uh, come to the ways of the Buddha. Uh, enlightenment and so forth. And, and also, interestingly, that itself, uh, at a certain point, they also uh, it raised the question whether a woman can follow the Buddha or not. So it, the question was put to the Buddha, eventually the Buddha said, yes, uh, the woman. I initially, he, he wants to discourage that, but eventually it came around, and said, yes, not only they can follow me, but they can also enter the stream and never return. No, this is very interesting. So the, the, the stream here, again, uh, comes up. Uh, it, it, um, you can enter the stream and never return. So that's a, these are the stages in, in um, leaving the household, uh, cutting the tie to just... Uh, um, re, um. So what happens when they start to do that? Well, once you get to that state, you, get, try, you are getting to the, uh, another realm, which is uh, heaven. And it is said that your, the, all the human lives come to an end, and then they, if they have practiced Buddha's way, they can be reborn in heaven. So you have a very interesting um, scene here. Uh, the set of four meditative states lead you to another realm, and then it's picked up at the end of the fourth stage, and then the um, Indra, uh, the ruler of heavens, heard that someone's coming. Well, no, put it this way. Um, the original text basically give you this scenario. Um, Indra heard that in this mountain called Mount Bidiyaka, which is near Magadha, um, Buddha has been in that fiery stone chamber practicing meditation. And Indra tells his followers, basically said, let's come and greet him. All right. So the text basically says that they visit this fiery grotto where Buddha has been meditating. But if you look at this scheme, it's almost like these become uh, this four cells become some kind of spaceship. They make it more of a sort of vehicle that carry you from one realm to another. And therefore, once you get the heavenly realm, it's almost like through air, in this meditative state, you are carried to another state, in which case it's the Indra and uh, attended by his son and another figure or group of figures called a panchika, which means music god. All right. So they, they, um, they, they basically, um, what, what they described, they, they kind of all of a sudden said, okay, let's visit that grotto. grotto. And, and they kind of just spirit themselves away and then find themselves landing in the neighborhood of the grotto. So it's, it's this spectacular thing. They were initially in heaven, and they say, let's go. And then a minute later, they found themselves 
near the grotto and open the gate of, of the grotto and say, how are you doing? How, how have you been holding up? And the Buddha basically said, I'm holding up very well. Uh, uh, and, um, and they try to serenade him through music and all that. But that's the original text. But if you look at the, in the larger scheme of what we described, actually they all connected. These two sections, segments are quite connected. So someone eventually end up being Indra's son to the left, and someone ended up being music gods. So if we examine our source closely and try to make, connect the dots, we found that in fact, it's these two groups. So what you have is that Gopi, the, the mother, become Indra's son because he says, she says, like in heaven I want to be a man. Or that's the sort of treatment a lot of them, the early Buddhism tend to have that sort of uh, issue um, which got our American um, undergraduate very incensed. Uh, but, 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 you know, <laughs> uh, we just have to take the early culture as it is, and uh, let's face it. Um, so, and then the three monks who eventually become the music gods, and the idea is that um, the woman says, I now get the upper hand because uh, in the earthly life, I attend to these monks. Now they attend to me. So that's the sort of reversal of the rule. All right. So in his, you could see that all this uh, happening, and there's more to that. In fact, the uh, Sanskrit word uh, uh, musician or, or uh, music god also means the five supernatural powers, five supernormal abilities. So it is this exactly these supernormal. Sometimes it's phrased as six, sometimes it's a five, but it's basically the same set of abilities that I just walked you through, right? So, um, so that's the kind of situation. Now, um, this cave is really remarkable, and it, um, so as it pushed to the final moment, it, it is another spectacular episode and that is the episode of what I call from this is sort of from body that transforms into shadow. So uh, you would, at the end of the side walls, you would have this scene, I just demonstrated, you would have a sculptural figure, a statue, and then towards the, the sort of uh, end of uh, the end wall, that is the end point, uh, the west wall, you would have uh, the Buddha appearing in a different kind of robe. So the difference between the two is quite remarkable. Um, and it's also at, at the deep level, one of the most ex, um, striking contrasts between what sculpture can do and what painting can do. Um, so basically, the sculptural figure still gives you a sense that there's a, still someone has a body. And when you get to this stage, you basically have a service that pretends to be it, well, a, a statue, but it's not. In other words, it's, it's a presence that is kind of, uh, you, you could see it, but you really couldn't touch it. So this is also another fundamental problem um, endlessly staged by our historians, what we call the tactile presence, something you can touch to verify its existence to the purely optical presence where you could see it, but you, you can't really touch to verify its existence. Now, this is not just empty metaphysical exercise. It, it actually has quite relevance in China and else in other places where Buddha has never set foot. So they have always to somehow convince people, especially the, the disbelievers that the Buddha exists among us or could be present. How do you say that? Well, you say, well, and actually the detractors will say, prove to me that Buddha exists in China. Has anyone ever seen a Buddha? So the apologist would say, okay, you have to just think this way. 
Buddha can only be experienced, accessed through dreams, meditation, or dream states. And they sometimes even draw analogy between dream and some kind of um, rapturous, uh, erotic uh, dream. They say, well, you, you, you had that experience last night, didn't you? Uh, but was that person there or not? Well, you had that experience. So he's there, he's not there. So, and then Buddhist uh, uh, apologists will say, yes, that's how you access Buddha. Um, he's there, but he's not there. You see him, you don't see him. Uh, absence is present, presence is absence. So that's what is going on here. So I think that they, they made a very deliberate choice of picturing the Buddha um, in this way. And also this, um, so this is a, rem I'll come back to, more to that point, but this is a very interesting moment also in how they turn optical into a drama. Let me sh uh, show you why that's the case, right? So this is a, uh, so the, the, the design really kind of uh, is built upon something that is in Afghanistan uh, area, in a Gandhara area, where you have a Buddha seated in a fiery grotto and then visited by Indra and the musicians, so you see the musicians. Um, this is a very important moment, I think, in world history of art. That is how to make cave, the dark cave, an interesting optical theater. Humans have been a long time being frightened of dark caves. And also for Chinese, the light and dark interplay has never been of any interest prior to Buddhism came into China. It wasn't, I mean, you know, they were talk about darkness, but they didn't make it into a sort of optical theater. So here, so, so let's look at how this happened as sort of, you know, as a world event. And, and so part of Dunhuang, the significance of Dunhuang is that it is part of the world narrative and how the human imagination went through certain stages and this is one of the key moments. So this design actually, um, in some interesting ways, stand in a very interesting relationship to the, this Roman design, uh, and this, this relief is now Israel, uh, but the Roman period. And what it shows is this Mithra, this, this Zoroastrian god, who is slaughtering the bull, and the slaughtering bull of this event uh, known as Taroctony, uh, the slaughtering of the bull is actually a sacrifice, a sacrificial moment. And this is a moment when um, you do that in order to uh, get a, f a fecundity of a new uh, harvest year. And so the, the whole thing is really about the change of time and you know, the change from light to darkness. For instance, you see the, the um, And this is uh, darkness because this guy has the torch down, and this guy has the torch up, which means the, from darkness to light. And in the process, this process also is shown as some kind of transformation taking place through uh, water purification and fire purification. Why? You see the water jar, you see the you know, uh, fire in the scene. So essentially, this firing process, water um, jar process is, 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 is a way of showing that, you know, through that transformative process, large, uh, light overcomes darkness and um, fecundity follows the sacrifice of the bull slaughter. So what it happens, of course, is to turn this cavernous dark space into a fecundous uh, uh, productive space, uh, turning something terrifying into something good. Um, now, apparently in the, well, this in itself is some kind of Roman imagination in contact with the Persian, ancient Persian imagination. 
and that results in, uh, that comes out of this uh, Zoroastrian um, um, belief and practice. Uh, in Indian proper, this, uh, they didn't make too much of this, this business, but I think in Central Asia, they really turn, they somehow take cue from this, or maybe they take cue from each other. I don't know which is a chicken, which is egg. But in any case, uh, 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 different cultures seem to be more or less into this cave thing around this time. And uh, to show that, in fact, uh, something good will come out of this uh, moment of meditation in this darkness of the chamber, all right? So apparently, uh, they were not into the bull slaughtering, uh, but they, they were very interested in, uh, in uh, the uh, meditation in the cave and turning that moment of darkness into total enlightenment. And uh, so, the, so, again, I want to emphasize what an important key moment it is in the history of Chinese imagination. Prior to that, and prior to this kind of cave moment, the Chinese imagination didn't make much of light and dark interplay as an optical drama. Didn't make much of, certainly didn't know ways of depicting mental event. Didn't know how to use this kind of uh, dark, cave situation as a setting for uh, a, a drama. But now they do, and this is a, a key evidence, a moment. And, and let's see how that is kind of uh, played out towards the, uh, in the final moment, as I early already uh, mentioned. Um, so you, you, basically the whole back wall is a materialization or representation of someone's thought. If you read the text about this moment of encountering shadow cave, it is really about, okay, now the practitioner, practitioners start to have this thought. What is thought? Um, it first conjures up an image of the Buddha in his precepts body, meaning in this kind of uh, monk robe, uh, uh, so this, this body is called a jie uh, shen, or precepts body. And, and then you visualize, or the practitioner visualize, that this Buddha in his precepts body, which is not the flesh body, um, sits in this barrel cave, or the cave of Lapis Lani. And then this is a moment of nirvana. And as you hold this thought, you have this vision, then Buddha gradually fill up all the 10 quarters of the cosmos. So what I'm saying, and, and also um, basically says that that Buddha that you see is like the moon in the water, the image in the mirror, and, and so on. So in other words, it is basically sort of image in the mirror. Um, it's there, it's not there, but it's splendid in this radiance. Um, um, they, back then, did, um, so they, they choose to uh, not use any color to, in order sh to show the sort of radiation, uh, radiance of this image. All right. And as I said, two things are involved. One is that it is in this so-called burial, burial um, grotto, and also that 10,000 Buddhas of past and present fill up the entire cosmos. And this is how they, they, they do it. So if you draw a virtual line across it, uh, all the Buddha to the left uh, carry the cartouche that can, with which we can identify. They all belong to the past culprit. And all the Buddhas to the right uh, with the cartouche as cues, we, we know that they all uh, Buddha of the future. In other words, this is a temporal spatial continuum that really transcends uh, the, the not normal time and space. Um, and so we essentially end up with the final wall depicting one thought. 
And that thought is something what I call the sort of mental image, and it is, which is largely to say that the entire cave is uh, what I started with, sort of uh, uh, Descartes' brain chamber. Entire cave depict the mental events, something that goes on in someone's mind. And again, I want to emphasize, this is a key moment. Prior to that, Chinese didn't know how to actually depict mental events. And from this point on, there's a sort of turning into this internal space and it can showcase the entire set of mental events. Now, I want to uh, end with a little clip and uh, also just to um, give you a little um, tip of what I'm currently doing. And in fact, I've just found it, uh, still doing it. Uh, it's a very hard work. Uh, uh, a lab called a Harvard Chinese Art Media Lab, conveniently called CAM Lab, Chinese Art Media Lab, CAM Lab. So what we do is to basically, in future, you don't need to invite me to London. All I can do is to send you a video that we produce with all this content, all this analysis, all built into the, 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 the film. So I just got a starting grant from Harvard. Uh, so I have ambition uh, starting with a series of six films, high-end films. We're not talking about little throwaway uh, videos, but high-end video, uh, uh, um, HD uh, films. Each film about one particular Dunhuang cave. I've lined up six Dunhuang caves. Um, uh, 254 is the first one of the series. So Harvard has agreed to fund my first one. So I still need to raise money to cover the rest of five. And I'm winking at the Robert Ho Foundation. <laughs> uh, um, so, so here's a um, video. Um, this actually initially came out of a student term paper. She said, instead of submit you a term paper, why don't I give you a video? I said, that'd be great. Uh, and, so, uh, and so this is a sort of edited, shortened version of a term paper.
Thank you. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Wang, for this uh, for this extremely thought-provoking uh, exploration of uh, of uh, one single Dune One Cave, and with this uh, fascinating video at the end. Uh, we have, um, if you are not too tired, we have still plenty of time for questions, and I'm sure this will stimulate a lot of uh, questions and comments from uh, from the audience. And so, yeah, feel free. Don't be shy. Uh, we can take uh, quite a bit of questions. Just raise your hands. And uh, we can uh, maybe yell. Uh, there is another microphone there. We can try to navigate. Thank you, Professor Wang, very much for the amazing lecture. I'm a DPhil student in Buddhist art from Oxford, and uh, I um, think after memorizing all the imagery you described, probably I'll be achieving the <laughs> meditative heaven as well. Uh, but my question is more uh, back to his historic side. Um, do you imagine that the pattern of these uh, caves or the designers who are responsible for the layout, uh, do they also have this intention in mind to project the mental optical theater? Thank you. That's a, that's a very good question. It actually gets us to a, one of the most vexed issue. I don't think the cave uh, patrons know anything. Oh, uh, well, no, not know anything, but uh, they, they most likely, they, they probably... Uh, well, certainly they, they were not part of the designer in the Dunhuang because I think the, uh, this design uh, blueprint came from the central uh, cosmopolitan area. And someone, wealthy family in Dunhuang, uh, you know, or typically from the uh, inscriptions and documents, we know that they typically say, well, now I have the money, I'm going to hire the best craftsmen available to do this. So most likely, um, uh, they would just hire the best people to do it, and then and they probably dictate to the the the, the group of craftsmen, the artisans, say, "Well, give me the best." So whatever that uh, was the fashionable in uh, Luoyang, uh, then probably got over here. Uh, so so therefore, the patron family, we don't want to. Um, uh, give them too much weight in the decision process. And, and, and also, we don't want to give any weight to, to anyone. And this is a larger system. Uh, uh, basically, a lot of people involved in creating such a design. So it didn't come prop up with any particular individual head. Uh, it was really a sort of group effort, so I think. That, that, but behind it is a system of uh, what's the good come out of it. Uh, so I didn't get to that part. Essentially, the, 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 it has to do with the, uh, why the patron family would bother to do something so expensive and lavish uh, in the first place. Um, especially, and here it gets to really the, the most uh, challenging problem, that this is not modern art gallery where they invite public to visit these caves and admire these paintings. These were owned or sponsored by the wealthy lay families and most like in uh, relatively uh, 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 obscure, uh, out of um, sort of normal, uh, normal common, uh, out of the madding crowd, says, let's say, in, in a quiet place and, and uh, presumably a lot of times just locked up. They're not for anyone there to see. Then the question is, why do they bother to cover the wall with all these paintings of meditation? And we know for certain that nowhere in our Buddhist text that ever said that in order to practice meditation, you need to look at the painting. 
it never stated, to my knowledge, it's never being stated anywhere, uh, which uh, further galvanized this question, why when meditation doesn't involve looking at the painting, why do people actually lay out the meditative process uh, on the wall and also uh, the wall is not open to the public as an art gallery space. Now, I have my theory about this, and, uh, but just I want to lay out the rationale. All right. The rationale behind this is that it basically has to do with uh, people's notion of karma uh, attribution. Uh, if your sister or brother is sick, you start to figure what caused it. And typically, the Buddhist way of explaining it is to say that, obviously, some karma in the past, either in your own previous life or your relative's parents' previous life, um, have done something that ca caused this. So then the Buddhist answer is, what shall we do? The, the, the standard answer is that repent. Then how do you repent? Then the medieval Chinese Buddhist standard practice is that you repent by visualization. It's a set visualization, meditative visualization that allow you to go through the motion. And once you go through the motion, uh, you would uh, stamp out those early karma uh, early uh, bad karma, and that will lead to a new, to a better position. Now, here's also where Buddhism parted ways with other religious tradition. The repent here doesn't actually really mean that you need to really look into your own past deeds, because the conviction is actually you don't know what you did in your previous life, because you even don't know what your previous life was like. So, so what do you do? Well, there's a sort of set, commonly shared kind of process of repentance. You just need to go through that. So to my knowledge, prior to Ming Dynasty, all the Buddhist repentance uh, goes, follow one common narrative, a common thread. And except one instance, uh, in the fifth century, uh, a, a writer named Sun Yue, he truly repented that as a teenager, he did some bad things. And, and other than him, that was the only case. And, and it was not until um, a Ming Dynasty then the repentance take on different twist and compassion where you truly get more individualized. But prior to that, it was just common thing. Like, you know, everyone followed the same motion and, and the repentance is a sort of more or less a collective process. So the conviction, therefore, is that if you do that repentance visualization, uh, good things will follow. Now, if I lay out this rationale as a sort of intellectual or background or some kind of background, one probably could infer why they were doing this. I, I, normally, if I spell it out, people find it in disbelief. All right, I just put it on the record. I just want to spell out. Okay, so what I think is happening is here, this painting is some kind of what I call automated repentance. You basically just set it in motion all the time in perpetual virtual ritual and, and something good will come out of it. Because otherwise, you wouldn't explain, A, why is it that meditation never requires you to do the looking at the murals? B, we also know that uh, 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 not, not, not many people necessarily go there to, to uh, watch these paintings. And also, we, have no, no, we know that in some other Buddhist caves where it's so tiny, but they have the entire program laid out on the wall that almost make it into some kind of machinery of visualization. So I once, maybe half jokingly, gave a talk to Harvard Business School and said, this is the artificial intelligence circa 500. <laughs> because it kind of automated a intelligent process. And, uh, uh, and uh, so, and people, not many, well, I, I don't know. I mean, people might find it controversial. But other than that, I don't have an answer. Why is it that meditation doesn't require 
working in the painting, but they actually paint out the whole meditation process on the wall. And also, why is it that the, this uh, uh, exists in faraway places where it's not an art gallery? Uh, it, was an, it was not intended art, as art gallery. Uh, so, things like that. Yeah. Any other question? Thank you very much for a mind-blowing experience. Uh, I'm uh, almost lost for words, but I have some words. <laughs> and uh, my first question um, uh, concerns the, uh, the date and, and the inspiration, apart from the textual inspiration which, which you've said. Um, in the case of 285, which we saw briefly in the CamLab video, um, uh, where we see these figures in the sky, there we know that the inspiration uh, comes from central China. But I wonder, is this really the case? As you just said, the model probably comes from central China in the case of cave uh, 254 and um, some other caves which follow the same model and which show no sign of wealthy patronage. Um, in fact, in Cave 263, uh, a lot of the donors, the original donors, are monks who are seen debating and walking around uh, and, and always is a question to me, what was the legacy of the Lian, who were active throughout the fourth century and who disseminated Buddhism to the central area through their activities in translating and so forth, the Buddha, and what is it, the Bodhidharma, the, the Bodhisattva of Dunhuang. So that's my question. Um, why did the Northern Way, or could the Northern Way sponsor uh, caves which seem to be entirely uh, inspired by Buddhist communities? Hmm. Thank you, Roderick. Um, that's a very well educated uh, uh, question, of course. Um, um, uh, not surprising that comes from you. <laughs> but. Um, Actually, 285, that's another big uh, film project uh, next, uh, uh, following this one. Uh, 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 we actually, um, I actually in, uh, conducted one entire seminar two years ago on Cape 285. And finally, we finally, to just report the good news, we finally decoded the whole, cracked the code, exactly. It took us a whole semester. I scared away all these other graduate students, leaving only two uh, die-hard loyalists working with me. And by the time, at the end of the semester, we kind of, we kind of figured out everything. We wouldn't leave. We just look at the wonder of this all, and just we're like, oh, this is so amazing. Um, but anyways, so uh, we did an initial report at the workshop in Getty, uh, and uh, upon um, the report, uh, uh, a studio head from Hollywood stood up and said, oh my God, compared with this, the Sistine Chapel is just so-so. <laughs> Wow, coming from a studio head. But anyway, uh, rhetoric aside, just to say that uh, we did actually find that uh, I think there are the, the good uh, tentative but still, I think, uh, interesting clues that uh, it came from uh, the northern, uh, the, from, the, from Luoyang, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, you know, a noble family being kind of semi-demoted, semi-sidelined to Dunhuang, region and brought with her. In fact, we kind of found it's a female. It was to honor a female, female patron. Um, uh, so they're kind of all kind of internal 
evidence we found. So, so yes, it, 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 has, it was, has deep connection with Luoyang. Uh, we can more or less establish that. 254, you're absolutely right, I mean, um, is slightly more complicated. Uh, we don't have uh, firm evidence other than that, you know, um, it kind of, I mean, at the end of the day, of course, they all come somewhere. Uh, someone were taking cues from Central Asia, especially Kitsol, uh, Kucha area, and, 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 and um, sort of integrate uh, the, those different kind of uh, body of information and models and then come up with this. 285 is more uh, discernible because it obviously also has a Southern Dynasty imprint. It also has you know, all these previous uh, Northern Way legacies. But 254, Cape 254, um, um, we, we just, at the end of the day, we just have to rely on the internal evidence because the, you know, there isn't much textual evidence to suggest. But in terms of monks and so forth, I, I think the, if we care to uh, examine the Northern Way uh, laity and, and the monastic community, it's actually not that clear cut because we all know that they, Sometimes some political court intrigues resulted in someone um, landed in monastic uh, circles, and, and, and I mean the connection. So, so uh, the the bottom line point is that the, the monastic circle and the laity were the boundary is very porous, and and therefore I would rather just uh, consider the whole thing as a result of them working together to produce this. But if, if we consider, for instance, the realm of heaven, at, uh, musicians in a, in a gallery, this gallery is uh, on a depicted projecting cornice. Yes. The model for that comes from Kizil, yes. uh, from Kucha, yes. the Kucha yes. area. Yes. Yes. If we look at cave 257, um, which is a, a, a similar cave, okay, we find actual stories depicted in the exact same way in Kizil and then in, uh, in, in Dunhuang. So the models, uh, of course, remodeled to fit Chinese architecture, but they're coming from the West at this period, the period when inspiration flows back to Dunhuang is much later, perhaps beginning with 285, but at this time, no. Okay, that's a fair argument because, yes, I would agree, concede that uh, uh, the, the Liangzhou area, obviously, is a breeding ground because when the uh, uh, sort of, you know, central China, the cosmopolitan area was uh, troubled by war, so forth. A lot of talents fled to Liangzhou, and Liangzhou became the bastion, what they called the Chinese learning. And, and also a lot of things, translation were conducted there, and that's so for sure. Yes, I would certainly uh, agree that, that that might be one of the sources. But uh, by 500, however, uh, Luoyang had gathered enough cultural capital and the sort of intellectual, artistic resources, and so forth. And then actually, at the, around time when uh, 254 was constructed, there's also evidence that if someone with Luoyang connection went there, went to Dunhuang, uh, brought with them the latest design, uh, and therefore you have a cave like this. But ultimately, uh, Roderick, I mean, uh, I basically think that, you know, this is the integration of cultural, all the neighboring uh, regions, and it's hard to ascertain one route of transmission. And I would just think that obviously it's a receptacle of all the cultures, you know, in the capital, in Western region, Kuchar, they all have played a role. But, uh, we have a survived example like this that basically testify to all these interregional interactions. That's that's for sure. I, I never 
uh, I don't worry about that. Yeah, I accept that. You know. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I had one further question, but I better yield to somebody else. <laughs> I actually, uh, I'm sure uh, many of us would have further questions, uh, but we run a bit out of time. Uh, so I, what I suggest is that we move to the Brunei suit to have uh, a drink, and you can rest a little bit, and then we can discuss more informally uh, uh, in, the, in the next hour or so uh, upstairs with, uh, with a drink and a, and a few bites. But thank you very much for this extremely stimulating talk. Thank you.